So the next uh, unit in the topic of radioactivity is looking at the link between radiation and half-life. Okay, so by the end of the unit, you should be able to do the following here. I'm going to go into detail. It's just your job to look at the learning objectives and make sure you're meeting them by the end of the unit. So how do we actually detect radioactivity? Okay, so in the previous unit, we looked at alpha, beta, gamma radiation. So how do we actually detect this form of radiation? Okay, so radioactivity can be detected using something called photographic film. Okay, that's kind of, if you're a nuclear power plant, you might have some photographic film on your badge or as a badge. So then if it decolorizes, it means there's been radiation. Or using something like a Geiger-Muller tube, okay, which is the image at the bottom of the page here. Okay, so radiation badges. Um, essentially, these are photographic films <coughs> which darken on exposure to radiation and light. Okay, so this, this man here working at CERN, uh, he has a badge which basically changes colour if there's a leak in radiation. So light can't penetrate the badge, but ionising radiation, like um, strongly uh, ionising radiation, like alpha particles uh, and beta particles and gamma rays can. Okay, so if the, the film darkens from white to black, it means you've got too much radiation and you need to get out of there. So the other possibility is using something called a Geiger-Muller counter. Okay, so this is a Geiger-Muller counter here. It's basically a, a wire electrode, which is plugged up to a electrical supply inside a metal tube. And in that metal tube is an inert gas. Okay, so what happens is that radiation produces uh, ions in the inert gas and what's going to happen is that you're going to have a positively charged uh, wire electrode and the metal is going to be negative that casing and you basically pulse a current through the wire and this uh, allows um, it to be registered on a current okay because you've got the movement of charge So this thin mica window right at the front here, okay, allows the least penetrating radiation, which we know is alpha because they're so heavy, to enter the tube. And gamma radiation in most beta can enter through actually also the sides of the tubes, okay, so even on the side. So in terms of uh, nuclear activity, activity of a radioactive source is equal to the number of decays per second, and it's measured in the unit of Becquerel's, after Henry Becquerel, which we looked at last lesson, who discovered radioactivity in the end of the 19th century. And one Becquerel means one decay per second. When we say decay, it means it's the uh, transformation of a element into another element, which is more stable by emitting either alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. So here's a question involving Becquerel. So a radioactive source undergoes 72,000 decays over a 10 minute period. What is the average activity in Becquerel's? Okay, so pause the video now and come back when you think you have an answer. Okay, so the key to the question, of course, is a little, little trick here. It's in a 10 minute period. So the average activity is uh, equal, so a Becquerel is equal to a decay per second. So you need to convert those minutes into seconds. 72,000 per 10 minutes, uh, so it's going to get 72,000 per 10 minutes, which is 72,000 times 10 times 60, because we're converting into seconds, and that's going to give you uh, 120 Becquerel, okay, and that's the units, of course, for decay. Question two, a radioactive source has an activity of 25 Becquerel, how many decays would you expect over a three-hour period? So again, pausing the video now and seeing what you end up with. Right, so what you should have said, well, the activity is going to be 25 Bachael, which is equivalent, of course, to 25 um, decays per second. 25 times 60 is 1,500 decays in uh, one minute. Um, and it's going to be 90,000 decays in one hour, 
or 90,000 times three decays in three hours, so 270,000 decays. Okay, so another concept you have to know is the concept of background radiation. Okay, so background radiation is the low-level ionizing radiation that's produced all the time. Okay, and the most common radiation occurs due to nuclear weapon testing, for example, in the Pacific, which doesn't happen so much. So nuclear weapon testing by the North Koreans. Okay, uh, and radon gas accounts for about 50% of the uh, natural background radiation. And there's two isotopes of radon. Remembering isotopes means there's more neutrons um, in one form than the other. Okay, so radon-222 and radon-220 are the two that you're looking at. And uh, they are produced by the decay of uranium and thorium in the Earth crust. And this gas seeps out into the atmosphere and forms in the basement and foundations of buildings. So here's a background radiation map here of the UK because areas which have uh, high uh, igneous rocks have higher background radiation due to this radon gas. Okay, so cosmic rays as well, uh, uh, an important issue. So cosmic rays come from space, uh, produced by nuclear reactions in the stars. Uh, they produce high energy particles, which bomb bomb bombard planet Earth. However, the, the atmosphere itself is quite good at protecting us. Um, but cosmic radiation becomes an issue when you're going into outer space and doing exploration out of space because the moon, Mars, they don't have the atmosphere that Earth has. Okay, and also as you go further up into the atmosphere, uh, you're going to get more uh, cosmic radiation um, entering you because the atmosphere is thinner. You've also got the uh, idea of internal radiation. So internal radiation is the background radiation due to radioactive sources inside our body. Okay, so you're actually also a source of radiation. So, for example, when carbon-14 um, is in your body, because it comes in naturally through um, breathing in carbon dioxide used in respiration, uh, and it's going to form parts of your cells, so you're going to start emitting radiation. And another one example could be uh, our strontium uh, gets exchanged for calcium in your bone, strontium-90, for example. So you also emit radiation. There's also artificial radiation due to man-made events. So, for example, uh, Fukushima, where you are releasing uh, radiation from nuclear testing on the Korean Peninsula, uh, radioactive traces used in medicine, and treating cancer. And uh, overall, though, artificial radiation is only a really small percentage of background radiation. Okay, so an example there being the explosion of the uh, Soviet uh, nuclear power station in the Ukraine in 1986. That's pushed a lot of radiation up into the atmosphere. So this is the background radiation part pie chart. So as you can see, the largest amount comes from air with 33.6%. And there's a minimal amount from nuclear weapons, um, but most of it comes in air, medicine, and in the ground, and food and drink. So just to complete this section before we move on to the next one around half-life. Uh, radioactivity was first discovered by Henry Bachael, I hope, in 1896, when he noticed that the radiation emitted by an ore of uranium caused the exposure of a photographic plate. Radioactivity can also be detected using a Geiger tube connected to an electronic counter or rate meter, and background radiation is mainly due to natural sources of uh, ionizing radiation, such as from radon gas that seeps out from rocks in the ground. Right, so that's, that's radiation. Um, but we're also going to look at something called the half-life. Not only a computer game. Okay, so the activity of the radioactive sample decreases over time, and we call this the half-life. Okay, so it's the average time taken for half the original mass of the sample to decay into another atom. Okay, so some half-life, so uranium has quite a long half-life. So one um, atom of uranium-238 decays every 4,500 million years. 235, 704 million years. Plutonium, 24,000 years. Carbon-14, 5,600 years. Strontium-90, 29 years. Hydrogen, 12 years. 
cobalt 60 used in medicine 5.2 years technetium 99m six hours radon 60 seconds and helium 5 one time 10 to the negative 20 seconds quite fleeting okay so let's now look at an example of uh, radioactive half-life at a k of a sample of strontium 90. so strontium 90 has a half-life of 29 years in 2012, a sample contains 18.2 grams of strontium-90. Okay, so 2012, 18 point grams, 18.2 grams. By 2041, that would have halved. Okay, so it'll be 9.6 grams of strontium-90. 2070, 4.8 grams of strontium-90. 2099, 2.4 grams of strontium-90. 2128, 1.2 grams of strontium-90. And by 2157, only 0.6 grams of strontium-90. Okay. So the mass of strontium is basically halving every 29 years, and it's being transformed into another stabler isotope. So when will it have a mass fall of 0.15 grams? Okay, pause the video now and have a think. Okay, so you should have got the answer 2,215. So it's going to be dividing in a half and a half again, basically. Another uh, 29 times 256 years, no, 58 years. Okay, so question one. At 10 a.m. in the morning, a reactive sample contains 80 grams of a radioactive isotope. If the isotope has a half-life of 20 minutes, calculate the mass of the isotope remaining at 11 a.m. Okay, so it's going to be an hour. It's got a half-life of 20, so it should have gone five decays. Okay, so, oh, three, sorry, three decays. So it means it's going to be half times a half times a half times 80, which should give you the answer of 10 grams an hour later. Okay, question two, calculate the half-life of a radioactive isotope in the source if its mass decreases from 24 to 6 grams over a period of 60 days. So again, pausing the video, let's see if you get the correct answer. Okay, so 24 grams times a half is 12 grams. Divide uh, by two again, 6 grams. Two half-lives occur in 60 days, so therefore the half-life must be half of that, 30 days. There are other ways to define half-life. We determine, uh, we use the terms of activity of a source. So the half-life of a radioactive source is the average time it takes for the activity to decrease by a half of the initial value. Okay. In terms of number of nuclei, the half-life of the radioactive isotope is the average time taken to, for half the nuclei of an isotope to decay into another more stable isotope. Okay. So look at the decay now of source Z. So source Z decays with a half-life of three hours. At 9 a.m. the source has an activity of 16,000 bacchlael, okay, 16,000. By 12 noon, that's gone down to 8,000. By 3 p.m., 4,000. 6 p.m., 2,000. 9 p.m., 1,000. And by midnight, it's going to be 500. That means the activity halves every three hours. So the half, what will the activity have fallen to 125 bacchlael? Okay, so you should have calculated it to become 6 a.m. Okay, half, 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 half. Okay, sample 3 to decay, this time of isotope X. So isotope X decays to isotope Y with a half-life of 2 hours. At 2 p.m., there is 6,400 nuclei of isotope X. Okay, there we go. Um, and then there's no nothing in nuclei Y. At 4 p.m. there's now 3,200 of nucleus, uh, nuclei X and 3,200 of nuclei Y. 6 p.m. 1,600 of nuclei X and now 4,800 of nuclei Y because it's going to be adding to that 3,200. 8 p.m. 800 of X, 5,600 of Y. 10 p.m. 400 of X and 6,000 of nuclei Y. And at midnight 200 of X and nuclei Y, 6,200. So when will the nuclei of uh, isotope X end up falling to 25? Okay, it will take a ton of six hours at 6 a.m. Looking at the next question, a radioactive source has a half-life of three hours. At 8 a.m., its activity is 600. What's its activity at 2 p.m.? Okay, so the activity AM is 600 bacchlael, 2 p.m. is six hours later, 
This is two half lives later, therefore the activity will be half twice, or 150 bakayo. Looking at now uh, the, the K of substance P, so substance P, the K is the substance Q with a half life of 15 minutes. At 9 a.m., there is 1,280 nuclei of substance P. So completing the table, so 1,280 for nuclei of P at 9 a.m., zero for Q. 9.15 is now 640 or half, and 640 for Q. 320 for P at 9.30, 960 for Q, because now you've added on to the 640 that was originally there. 160 at 9.45 for 11.20 of Q and 80 at 10 a.m. to 1,200 for Q, and 10.15, 40 of P, and 12.40 of Q. So how many nuclei of substance P will be left after 11 a.m., so 45 minutes later? You should have got the answer 5. Okay, question number 4. A sample of 8 billion nuclei of hydrogen-3 atoms uh, so hydrogen-3 is a half of 12 years. How many nuclei will remain after 48 years? Okay, so 48 years is 4 times 12. That's 4 half-lives. So half times a half times a half times a half times 8 billion, which is 500 million. You can also uh, find the half-life from a graph, okay, which we'll, we've done as an activity. So basically, if 500 is the number of nuclei at the start, you basically go down and say, well, when's it going to have? Okay, so it's going to be at 250, roughly. Okay, the half-life is going to be the difference between when the sample is halved. Okay, so difference between 400 and 200. There we go, it's got 40 minus 10, so 30 seconds in this particular case. Okay, a more accurate value can be obtained by repeating the method with other initial nuclei numbers and then taking an average. Okay, question one, estimate the half-life of the substance whose decay graph is shown opposite. So again, pausing the video, making sure you're aware of that. Okay. So again, using the mathematics that we did in the last slide, you can see that the half-life is approximately 20 seconds. Question two, the mass of a radioactive substance over an eight hour period is shown in table below. Draw a graph of the mass against time and use it to determine the half-life of the substance. Okay, they'll leave that to you to do. Okay, so you should find the answer to be about two hours. So just to finish up here, the uh, half-life of a radioactive substance is the average time taken for half of the nuclei of the substance K. It's also equal to the average time taken for the activity of the substance to halve. The half-life of a carbon-14 is about 5,600 years. If today a sample of carbon-14 has an activity of 3,400 bacriol, then in 5,600 years' time it should have fallen to 1,700 bacriol. 11,200 years later, the activity should have fallen to 425, and the number of carbon-14 nuclei would have also decreased by eight times. Okay, so just... Finishing up by linking radiation to half-life, a few questions that you can consider in order for looking at PrEP. Okay, so there you go, five different questions to look at. And there's some online simulations which can also help your understanding of this topic.